in our society what has been said about Vietnam and Vietnam veterans has not always been true. As I said in the prologue to my book, Hollywood got it wrong every damn time. And interestingly, that line jumped off the page right into the face of a guy named Randall Wallace about 10 years ago. He had grabbed the book out of a bookstore on the way to an airport and was reading it, reading the prologue, and he was a, a screenwriter. And he said, that was so in my face that I was determined to try to make one true movie about Vietnam. And he did. <laughs> Called We Were Soldiers. It came out last year. And, and a brilliant job he did. I, I have no, uh, no, no written speech. I'm just going to talk to you. But before I really get into this thing, uh, would all of you who served in Vietnam please stand and be recognized? For me, it was taking one step onto a Huey helicopter the afternoon, early evening of 14 November 1965. But getting there, getting to that point, people to ask me, if you had this all to do over again, would you do it again? And I say, you know, I wasn't forced at gunpoint to do any of this. I was a multiple volunteer. I fought, schemed, and begged to get to Vietnam. As a kid, I read the, the collected works of Ernie Pyle. Not just his war writings, but, but the things he wrote, the collected columns that he wrote before the war when he was traveling, traveling across America, just writing about people. And I always knew I wanted to be a reporter. And I thought, if during my time, my generation, there is a war and America is in it, I want to go there and I want to cover American soldiers and I want to do it the same way Ernie Pyle did, as best I can. But I started reading these stories out of a place called Saigon and they were written by men whose bylines were Neil Sheehan for UPI, David Halberstam for the New York Times, Malcolm Brown for the Hated AP. And I said, you know, it's coming. We're going to have a war there. This is 1963, mind you. We're going to have a war there. It's going to be my generation's war, and I have got to cover it. And so I began a campaign, a weekly letter to my bosses in New York explaining to them in detail why they should send me to Asia. And I think it came to the point where either they had to send me or fire me because I was not going away. I was more persistent than a tick. And uh, I had covered the 64 election campaign and, and the election itself. And once I saw Lyndon Johnson was going to win, I knew we were going to war there because he said we weren't. <laughs> and we both come from Texas, and I knew about his lies. <laughs> so I was home in Texas uh, taking a week off. Uh, the phone rang, and it was my boss in Dallas. And he said, do you own a trench coat? And it was a puzzling reference to me. I had no idea what the man was talking about. And I said, huh? And he said, you've just been transferred to UPI Asia headquarters in Tokyo as quickly as you can get there. Unprecedented to be transferred from a one-man bureau in the middle of the country to Asia. But I pulled it off. And I found myself... I got there in November of 1964 and immediately asked for transfer to Saigon and, and the boss said, this is never going to happen. We've got two guys there covering this situation and I can't see that we'll ever need any more than that. And so I bit my tongue 
and in March the 1st Battalion of the 9th Marines came ashore at Da Nang and two weeks later I was on my way to Vietnam. Just as quickly as possible through Saigon, got my press pass. Interestingly, Vietnam was the, until now, the most openly covered war in the history of our country. You got your press pass, you were fr that was your ticket to ride. You could get on any military aircraft, boat, whatever truck, whatever's moving, and go to a unit and stay as long as, as your bosses would allow, as long as your own courage would allow. But, you know, when I went there, all I knew about covering wars, I had gained from a careful study of John Wayne movies. <laughs> and I thought, I've really got to hurry and get there because the Marines have landed and this thing may be over with in a hurry. And so I did, I got there. And I would tell you of my first day in actual operations in Vietnam. I had got my pass, spent a night in, uh, in uh, Saigon. I was told that my job was in Da Nang. I was told to go to Tonsonut Air Base and get on an Air Force C-123, which was the milk run. It went all the way up to Hue and then back to Da Nang. I think I traveled for about seven hours. And I staggered off of this thing, my ears ringing, a Samsonite suitcase that my mother had given me for graduation from high school in my hand. I think she was sending me a message. Uh, and a very excited, dark-skinned gentleman ran up and he said, you are Galloway? And I said, yes. He says, I am Henri Huet from UPI. I am a photographer. And there is big trouble in Quang Nai which I had no idea where that was. You must come with me. And I said, what about my suitcase? And, and he told me uh, to do a physical impossibility with that suitcase. <laughs> and he threw it in the 8th Aerial Transport Squadron hooch and drug me to a C-130, which was sitting on the ramp, spinning up, and we jumped in, and, and we were off, and it was a short hop, and we landed in a place called Quang Nai City, and, and it looked like an anthill that had been stirred with a stick, and we got off that plane, and, and Mr. Hewitt immediately ran over to a Marine CH-34 helicopter, and he talked to this guy who was wearing a flight suit and he waved at me and we were suddenly on this helicopter going I do not know where. And the, we flew about 10 minutes out from Quang Nai City and, and there was a bald hill sitting in the middle of these huge rice paddies and we circled this, this thing probably at a thousand feet and then slowly coming down and I could see glimpses out the door and I could see a lot of people lying on this hill in little, not foxholes, they didn't have time. They had dug little shallow depressions, just enough to get a few inches lower than the ground. And we landed and they shut the helicopter down and we stepped out and there was total silence. There was a battalion of South Vietnamese soldiers and every one of them was dead. They were lying in those holes as though they were holding rifles but the rifles were gone. And how we got this ride was the Marines were coming out to recover the bodies of the two American advisors to this battalion and they needed help getting them back to the helicopter. And so we went hole to hole until we found those two Americans and carried their bodies back to the helicopter. And as we flew back, I thought, there's nobody in here who looks like John Wayne. This is going to be a long, hard war. That night, Quang Nai Airstrip, it seems, closed down at dark. Henri Huet, 
who was a very brave man who died in a helicopter crash in 1971. He says, you know, all the Americans leave here and go back to Da Nang at night, but if we stay, we'll be ready to go early in the morning, long before the first planes come back in. So let's go over to the military assistance group compound and spend the night with them. And we went over and a very tall, very tired captain of infantry, his eyes brightened. He said, welcome. We've all been on 100% alert for the last five nights. So you get to do guard duty tonight. <laughs> And he said to Henri, you'll be midnight to 3 a.m., you'll be 3 a.m. to dawn. And he handed us the old M2 grease gun, submachine gun, 45 caliber, and he showed me how to operate it, how to load it, how to clear it, how to safe it. And I lay in that bunk with just my eyes big as pie plates until 3 a.m., which came very soon, and I was shaken, handed my weapon, and sent to the bunker. And I stood there like a tree full of owls, just looking at everything and seeing nothing. And during the longest night of my life, those three hours till sunrise, the enemy did a satchel charge attack on the Arvin compound across the road a little too close for my taste. And finally, I could see a little brightness in the sky and, and uh, I thought, I've made it. But then out of that darkness came a Vietnamese guy, an old man on a bicycle with a huge parcel on the handlebars. And I unsafe that grease gun and I drew a bead on him and I said to myself, if he moves so much as a finger, I'm blowing him away. And about then that tall captain hit me on the shoulder and he said, don't shoot him, son, or you'll have to cook breakfast. That's the, that's the chef. <laughs> uh, my introduction to the Iodrang Valley, uh, uh, like I said, I'd covered a lot of operations, including uh, an amphibious combat assault with G Brother Gill here. Uh, but in the fall of that year, I moved up. I heard, I, you know, the Marines walked to war. I had worn out two pairs of boondockers. I had patty foot and crotch rot and everything else you could imagine. I was absolutely sick of those rice patties that we were walking through. And I heard about this army division coming in, which had 435 helicopters. And I said, by God, I'm going to ride to war. <laughs> and I moved up to the Central Highlands and hooked up with the, the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile. And uh, a few days before the Iodrang operations, I made the acquaintance of the 1st Battalion, 7th U.S. Cavalry and its commander, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore, and its command, Sergeant Major Basil L. Plumley, out of West Virginia. And I did a long walk with them in the, in the hot sun east of Play Me Special Forces Camp and Right before dark, we forded a mountain stream, neck deep, coldest water I've ever been in, and then huddled in our wet in our ponchos. And we were on a mountain plateau at about 3,000 feet. I spent the coldest night of my life. No fire, no cigarettes, no nothing. Just laying there with my teeth chattering sun finally starts to make its appearance and I fish around in my pack and I find this fist sized lump of C4 plastic explosive that all good boy scouts carry and I pinch off a piece about that big and I light it with a match because it is wonderful 
20 seconds, you've got a canteen cup full of boiling water. It burns with a great fire. And my water was just about boiling when I looked up, and there stood Plumley and Colonel Moore. And the colonel looked at my hot water, and he looked at me, and he said, in this outfit, everybody shaves every morning. <laughs> and I looked at my coffee water, and I looked at him, and I fished out my razor, and there went my coffee water. But on the night when it counted, there were half a dozen reporters trying to get into the fight that had begun in landings on X-ray in the Yadrang Valley. One of them was my nemesis from the Associated Press, Mr. Peter Arnett. And I foxed all of them out of their drawers. I got in, they did not. We were trying desperately, every helicopter that came near the fire base where, where the artillery was supporting this battle, but none of them were going the right direction for us. But I had a, an ace in the hole. I ran into Colonel Moore's S3, his operations officer, Matt Dilla. I said, Matt, i got to get in there. He said, well, I'm going in as soon as it's dark with two helicopters full of ammo. But I can't put you on those choppers. That's up to the old man. I said, well, get him on the radio. And I stood there and listened as he gave a quick sit rep to Colonel Moore and said, I'm coming in, I'm bringing this, I'm bringing these people. And oh, by the way, that reporter Galloway that marched with us the other day, he wants to come too. And the answer from Colonel Moore was this. If he's crazy enough to want to come in here and you've got room, bring him. Smart man. Smart man. He believed that the American people had a right to know what was happening with their sons and daughters in Vietnam. An absolute right. And, and so he was not afraid of the press. He welcomed us. He welcomed me. So here I was. I spent that night, after a little briefing from the colonel with my back against a small tree, my cameras beside me and my M16 rifle across my knees. And it was noisy and flares and probing attacks, but nothing big. And I sat there thinking, I've got the world in a jug and the stopper in my hand. I've got an exclusive seat at the biggest battle of the war. And that lasted until 10 minutes before 7 in the morning when two battalions attacked the lines of Charlie Company on the southeast side of the perimeter. About a thousand of them against a hundred of us. And everything that we, our command post was right behind Charlie Company. So everything that was fired at Charlie Company that didn't hit something passed right through the command post about that high. And I was flat on my belly feathering out at the edges, cursing my zippers for keeping me low, keeping me from getting lower, when I had a thump in my ribs. And I, I reached like this, and I looked, thinking I might have been hit by something, and I had. It was a combat boot, size 12, I estimated, and it was on the foot of Sergeant Major Basil Plumley. Now, Plumley was a bear of a man what the paratroopers call a five-jump bastard. <laughs> All four jumps combat in World War II of the 82nd Airborne Division. Sicily, Salerno, Normandy, and Market Garden, the bridge too far. One combat jump in Korea with the 187th RCT. This man was working on his third award of the Combat Infantry Badge, and how rare that is. I will tell you that the United States Army only ever handed out 270 of those, period. Plumley bent at the waist, and it, uh, this was a firestorm. 
and the din of combat for those who have not experienced it is deafening. Uh, it is a noise like no other. It, it seeps into your bones. And Plumley hollered. He had a parade ground voice. And he hollered, bend at the waist so he'd get closer, and he hollered down at me, and what he said was this. Can't take no pictures laying on the ground, Sonny. <laughs> well, I thought he's right. Later I would learn that sergeants major are always right. But I also thought this looks dire indeed, and, and we may all die here today. And if I'm going to die, I would just as soon take mine standing up alongside a man like the sergeant major, so like a fool, I got up. And the sergeant major went about his business, and I followed, and, and his next stop was our aid station, such as it was. It was the battalion surgeon, Dr. Carrera, an honorary captain, drafted out of his residency. Uh, and Sergeant Keaton, the medical platoon sergeant, all the others who normally would be in that battalion aid station had been farmed out to the companies because between Lyndon Johnson refusing to declare a national emergency and freeze tours of duty and malaria, we'd lost a couple of hundred men should have been 750 men in Colonel Moore's battalion, actually closer to 400, 410. That's how badly below strength he was. And what that meant was all the medics were with the companies. Plumley leans over into the face of Dr. Carrera and says, gentlemen, prepare to defend yourselves. And he whipped out his 45 and jacked around into it, and Carrera's eyes were big as dinner plates. He hadn't volunteered for this. He hadn't signed up for this, and he sure didn't think it was, you know, his job to be pulling triggers. But the sergeant major knew something. He knew that we were in danger of being overrun. He knew that he needed to gather up whatever he could sweep up, including the doc, the cook, uh, uh, and one civilian media puke, and, and get them ready because the guy, bad guys may be coming across that clearing any minute. So I learned something. I learned a valuable lesson that instant. You can be afraid, but when you start doing your job, the fear goes away. And I sometimes tell people, I, everything, you know, there's somebody made a lot of money writing a book called Everything I Know I Learned in Kindergarten. <laughs> well, everything I know I learned in combat. I learned all about leadership and courage and what gets you through, and most important, the quality of the soldier the NCO, the officers that were present, doing their job. 65% of Colonel Moore's battalion were draftees. They were, most of them, drafted at the end of 1963. Uh, they were out of a different America. Who was being drafted in 1963? If you didn't have the money to get in, your mama couldn't get you in college. If you weren't married and didn't have kids. If you were just hanging out, pumping gas, uh, being a farm boy or whatever, the draft board got your ass. Uh, it's interesting. No fewer than 20 men from a hundred mile radius of my little hometown in South Texas were in this battle. On that battlefield I ran into a classmate of mine from Refurio High School, class of 59. 
There were only 55 of us in that class, and here's one of them standing in front of me. His cousin is right over there. And they were all carrying names like Garcia, Hernandez, Figueroa, Jimenez, and I could not be more proud of them. At home, they could and were treated as second-class citizens. But on that day, in that place, who was there? Who was standing up for America? Who fought there and died there? Men who had less than two weeks left on their tour of duty, who should have been on a freedom bird going home, we put on helicopters wrapped in ponchos to fly home in an aluminum casket. And so I have a totally different view of Vietnam veterans. And I think mine is the true and correct view. And I say to them, often as I can, you may not have been the greatest generation, but by God, you were the greatest of your generation. I tell you what, I was on a panel once about 10, 11 years ago down in Southern Virginia at Hamden Sydney College with none other than Oliver Stone. And you know, he had nothing to say that I was interested in hearing. His remarks were unexceptional. But somebody had tipped me that his old company commander was in the audience. And so as soon as this panel was over, we repaired to a cocktail hour and I immediately looked this guy up, a retired colonel named Bob Hemphill. And I said, okay, what's true about platoon? He said, well, it's a, it's a pretty good depiction of what it's like to move a battalion through triple canopy jungle, but beyond that, nothing. He said, I ran a tight infantry company. Oliver Stone was a good soldier, earned a righteous purple heart and a righteous bronze star, but I don't know where the, he pulled this story out of. He said, we would be in the bush for two weeks, on patrol, constantly moving, setting up ambushes. We would come back to a fire base at the end of two weeks. We had two days. The first day, you got a shower, you saw the docks, you got your leech bites and your scratches and your burns fixed. You drew a clean uniform. And at the end of the day, you got two cans of hot Pabst Blue Ribbon beer live in large. <laughs> and the next morning, you cleaned your weapons, you drew ammo, you drew supplies, and we did the map talk, and by nightfall we were out of there on another two-week patrol. He said, my NCOs did not shoot each other. My men didn't have time or the inclination to smoke dope. I said, you know, you ought to write that story. And if you'll write the book, I'll write the foreword. And he did, and I did. So it's out there. Look it up. Bob Hemphill. I think it's called Platoon. And there's the true story. The truth, however, has a hard time catching up with lies. It moves too slow. Uh, the picture that has been portrayed of the Vietnam veteran is totally wrong. The Vietnam veterans I know are teachers, bankers, lawyers. They do a thousand different jobs. They came home to no welcome. They fought in a war they didn't ask for. They came home to disrespect, suspicion, accusations, and we went to ground in the crossfire, just like we did in those jungles long ago, and just laid low and did our thing. 
But my thing, and Colonel Moore's thing, was to tell the truth. We spent ten years researching our book. This was before the worldwide phone directory was on two CDs. <laughs> we had to first find and then interview 250 plus individuals, some of them in Vietnam, most of them scattered all over America, and we found them by ones and twos. And we got their stories. You know, military history in particular has usually been written by someone who was hundreds of miles away and is operating from after action reports and yellowing papers. And if you ask them why you don't talk to the grunts, they say, oh well, they only see 10 meters either side of their foxhole. And that's true. But we resolved to find one grunt for every 10 meters, 360 degrees. And guess what? The real truth is in their stories. The real history. And you know, they're very modest. Often they wouldn't tell you much about what they did, but they would tell you hours worth about what Johnny did in the foxhole over here and Sam did over here. And all we had to do was cross-reference and we could put together the story. So we got it done. We worked awful hard on it. We've done everything we can to give back to the Army, the Marines, the Navy, America, in the years since it was published. Uh, we worked, by the way, eight years with Mr. Wallace on the movie before it ever saw the light of day. Uh, we're proud of it. It's 85% reality based on the book and 15% Hollywood, which they couldn't resist. <laughs> Though we beat them hard around the head and shoulders. Uh, it's good. It's good. It tells an honest story for once. Is on the cover of our book, Lieutenant Cyril R. Rick Rescorla, <clears throat> an Englishman. Born in Cornwall, served in the British Army, served London Bobby, served as a, I guess the words, mercenary in the Rhodesian territorials, fighting the Marxist guerrillas. Came to America in 1962 or 3 because he thought we were going to war too, and he wanted to be a part of it. He came here and immediately enlisted in our army, was sent to uh, boot camp, best guy there, sent to OCS number one in his class, assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, sent to Vietnam, sent to the Iodrain Valley. His company was chosen to reinforce Colonel Moore's battalion, and he was immediately plugged into the section of line where we were virtually overrun. Bravo Company, first of the seventh, had lost something like 75% of its men in a half a day. The enemy thought those remnants were still holding that section of the line. In point of fact, they were pulled out, and Bravo Company, second of the seventh, full strength, 110 men, was put into those positions. We called it the Foreign Legion. The company commander was Myron Duduric, a Ukrainian immigrant. Grew up in New Jersey, tough, tough guy. Best company commander Hal Moore ever saw in three wars. And one of the platoon leaders was Rick Rescorla, Rick Rescorla, the Englishman. These two guys got busy. They had a little breather, so they pulled the lines in a little tighter, dug deep foxholes instead of these little shallow body holes where too many of our men died. They dug three-man foxholes 
this deep with firing steps. They got the men out and they cut this elephant grass or stomped it down. They went out 200 meters and set out trip flares and alarms that would pass, let us know they were coming. Then they registered the artillery. Front, back, and sideways, they had this battlefield covered. Then they sat back to wait for the attack they knew would come. And it was night. And at 3 a.m., when it is darkest in anyone's soul, especially on a battlefield, Rick Grescorla moved from foxhole to foxhole, talking to his men. And then he sang to them. He sang the old Welsh mining songs. He sang the songs of the British Army in the Zulu Wars. And he built strength and confidence in them. And sure enough, here came the enemy, two battalions strong, just before daybreak. And they were thrown back, bloodily. And they came again, and they were thrown back again, and they came a third and final time, and they were smashed. This company had killed 400 of the enemy at a cost of six Americans lightly <coughs> wounded. Brilliant job. Uh, Rescorla got a silver star, finished his tour, came home to America, home to America, First thing he did was raise his right hand and be sworn in as a citizen. Went to law school, got a law degree, Oklahoma. Taught, taught college for a while, I think in South Carolina, but gravitated towards security work. Became the vice president of security for Morgan Stanley Brokerage, New York City. He was a hero in the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. Last man out of the building after he made sure everybody was out. Uh, came out covered in soot, choking and coughing. Next week he went to his employers and he said, you know, most of your people live in New Jersey. This building was a target last week. It will be a target again. So why don't you move headquarters to New Jersey, build a low-rise, high-security facility, and we'll all love you better for it. And they said, sorry, we have a long-term lease on these 22 floors in Trade Tower 2. 3,000 employees on those floors. Rick Rescorla said, okay, if that's how it is and you won't listen to reason, you can give me the time and money that it takes to run five or six full evacuation drills every year so that everybody knows how to get out of this death trap. And they laughed. They called them Rick's fire drills, but he insisted. And on September 11, 2001, Trade Tower 1 is hit. The squawk box in all of the offices in Tower 2, the Port Authority squawk boxes, are saying, stay at your desk. Don't panic. You're safe here. No sweat. And Rick Rescorla looked out that window at that burning building and he said, bullshit. He grabbed his bullhorn and he went floor by floor, 22 floors, ordering the evacuation by the buddy system, two by two, down those 66 flights of stairs. Off they went. And when their building was hit, and the smoke poured into the stairwells, and people threatened to panic, Rick Rescorla sang to them. He sang, God bless America. Pulled out his cell phone, called his wife. Told her he loved her. He got them all out but five, and he was on his way back up to get the stragglers last seen on the 10th floor when the building came down. They never recovered his body. One more thing. Three years before September 11th, Rescorla had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. The doctors gave him six months to live. 
but he beat it. God had one more thing for him to do. I call it the power of one man, the power of one. He saved 3,000 lives, but each of those lives, each of those humans had a spouse, children, mother, father, brothers, sisters. The circle widens so far. How far? I think the people from the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund can tell you that of the 58,234, five, 235 names on that wall, there are 20 some million people in America who have a direct connection to them familial, friend, classmate, concentric circles. So, yes, that's the story of the man on the cover of the book, my friend Rick Resforo. You know, we don't have enough time for me to say all that I would want to say about the docs. What remarkable people. We took 19 of them into the Idrang Valley, not one of them came out on his own feet. Uh, you know, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for the sake of another. And that is the credo of the medics, the docs. And I would tell you, you know, Doc Carrera, the battalion surgeon, he thought he shouldn't have been there. He thought he was being misused to be on the battlefield, that he should have been back at Charlie Med with an, you know, an operating table where he could really do work. And so was a, something of a bitter man, but I persuaded him to come to one of our dinners. His wife forced him, I think. His kids forced him, and, and he came. And uh, when he was introduced, he got a standing ovation. I think there were something like 30 men in that room who owed their lives to him. I watched him do a battlefield tracheotomy with a pocket knife and save a man's life. Uh, the enlisted docs, the medics, I, when everybody else goes to ground is when they have to stand up and move. War is hell on medics, and it's hell on photographers, too. You can't do that job laying on the ground. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I have a special place in my heart for all of the docs. Thank you. I salute you. We did find and recover the diary exactly as depicted in the in the movie and and it was you know basically a series of letters from this north vietnamese soldier to his wife and and it's almost pure poetry and we had it translated and in fact we quote some of it in the book and and we have taken steps to return that diary to vietnam and to the family of that soldier when those telegrams, those terrible telegrams started coming in, they had no casualty notification system. So they handed them, Western Union handed them over to yellow cab drivers to take them out and shove them into the hands of new widows. Uh, a horrible job. Uh, and done badly. Uh, one widow of one of our first sergeants, Jack Jell, opened the door at one o'clock in the morning to find a totally drunk out of his mind taxi driver standing there, shoving her the telegram, telling her that her husband was dead in battle, and then fell backward and passed out in her flower bed. And she's trying to deal with her own grief and this, this cab driver passed out in her flower bed. Uh, horrible things happen. Uh, a, a, a young Hispanic widow 
opened her door to get the telegram, she I think was eight months pregnant, passed out, just fainted right there. The cab driver doesn't know what to do. Mrs. Moore, Julie Moore, and Mrs. Kennard, wife of the division commander, burned up the phone lines to Washington, D.C. They raised hell six feet and put a concrete block under it. And two weeks later, this was changed. And, and the casualty notification system that we know where a chaplain, an officer, and one or two others come to the house prepared to help was instituted, reinstituted.